Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I just wanted to do a quick introduction um, and reintroduce or introduce myself. Uh, my name is Melanie Thomas. I'm the school counseling department supervisor um, for both high schools and West Hartford public schools. So I work at both Hall and Conard, and we're so glad that you can join us tonight for this presentation. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Charles Wareham from Valark Financial um, Baylark Financial, and I'm going to have him take it away. Thanks, Charles, for being here. Awesome. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Malene. Uh, yes, my name is Charles. I'm a financial advisor. I've been doing this just shy of 30 years now, and I run Baylark Financial in downtown Hartford. We specialize in helping families understand the college funding process, kind of getting kids into the pipeline, if you will, and then uh, helping parents themselves find financial independence and retirement for themselves. Uh, so thank you for coming out tonight. I see a lot of familiar faces, actually. I see some of our colleagues and uh, some of our clients and friends as well. So thank you again for uh, coming out. A little bit of housekeeping for tonight. If you do have a video uh, feed, if you could kindly share, if you're willing to, it's really best to do uh, these presentations with smiling faces rather than dark boxes. And I also want to share with you that we do have an operator online tonight. Her name is Catherine. And so if you need tech support or have uh, any issues during the presentation, just page Catherine on Zoom and she will assist uh, with whatever uh, we need. We're not gonna take questions through the presentation, but towards the end, we will open the floor up for both audio questions for those brave enough to uh, speak in the group, uh, but also text questions who would rather be a little bit private uh, later on. Uh, finally, one last little bit here. There are some files I would like to share with the group. And I'm going to ask Catherine to post those into the chat. And these are uh, uh, two files, actually. One of them is a PDF of the workbook that we normally hand out in person. And thanks to COVID, of course, we're doing this online. So we're going to deliver our workbook via PDF. And of course, if anybody would like a hard copy, just send us uh, an email or message and we'll happily ship you a hard copy. The other, uh, we're not gonna go a lot into how to actually complete the FAFSA form. So I do wanna share with you some tips and tricks uh, on completing the FAFSA and hopefully that can help to guide you a little bit uh, as we go. So uh, let's jump into the presentation here. Do, 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 and there we go. If someone, uh, Malene, could you give me a thumbs up if you see the uh, slide deck there? Fantastic, awesome. So yes, uh, uh, first of all, if, if you wanna take notes, I do find a lot of people wanna jot stuff down during the presentation. And of course, by all means, jot down our contact information and our website, uh, which is www.vaylark.com. Uh, and uh, certainly if you'd like some support or would like to reach out at any time, we're happy to help you. And there we go. And I also wanna share with you that we produce a lot of video content. So if you go to YouTube and just search Valark, V-A-Y-L-A-R-K, you're gonna come up with a lot of content that hopefully can help you in many ways, including uh, a recording of this presentation that was done at Farmington, I believe earlier this year. And uh, also there is a uh, recording of this presentation done live. I think it was two years ago at Glastonbury and also a couple of other pieces such as uh, a, a demo of our how to pay for college building cash flow models. We'll, we'll get into some of this, but I just wanna make sure you know there's additional content to use if you need to tell somebody else what it was we talked about tonight or refresh your own memory, YouTube and our video content is a great place to go. So, uh, you know, I wanna share with you a little bit about myself. I'm a parent just like you, man. I got a sophomore at Penn State. I mean, I'm, I get choked up. I'm unbelievably proud of him. He's fourth generation Penn State. He's doing a great job. And so I can address this topic not only from the perspective of financial advisor, but also as a parent. And I can share with you that I have sat in the same rooms that you will sit in or virtually in one way or another at these college university visits where they talk to you about how wonderful their school is and why you should attend and all the things you need to know and, and do to apply. And eventually, you get to, in these presentations, a slide that's kind of like this one. 
And it says something like 75% of UConn students will receive some form of financial aid. Nearly a third receive merit dollars. And that's it. That's all they have to talk about for a number of reasons. And, you know, I think these guys here are really great people, but they don't know anything about your personal financial situation, nor are they licensed or qualified to talk about these topics. So I'm grateful that Moline and folks from other schools like West Hartford have us come in to talk about this so we can share with you the information you need to be successful. I want to take that massive amount of information that is out there and boil it down to boots on the ground strategy that you can use and deploy in your family to be successful with college funding. And partly so that when you get to the kitchen table and you are talking to your kids about what is doable, realistic, and affordable in terms of college cost, you are coming from a reality-based place. There is so much myth and so much disinformation about financial aid scholarships in college that one of my primary goals here is to dispel all those myths and share with you the truth of what we have found of 30 years of sitting in this chair and working with thousands of Connecticut families so that you can be successful as possible. And uh, I'm gonna share with you what we call the five partners. These are the folks that we feel, uh, you know, really participate in making college, paying for college possible, and they need to work together. And so we need to understand what they do, but also what they can't do. And of course, the first of those is the government, and the government does make available that FAFSA form, free application for student aid. And this is really, in my opinion, I think uh, the entry point for the paying for college process. And you'll probably be going to FAFSA.gov at some point soon and uh, creating a user ID and a PIN if you haven't already and starting to populate this form. In fact, the form opens up October 1st for the uh, school year in the fall. So very, or, or the following fall, excuse me. So very likely you will be doing the FAFSA and other paperwork along with your college apps and your essays and admission process and so on. And you know the FAFSA is gonna ask you some stuff. You're gonna to need to create a profile. It's gonna ask for information about your assets, your business. Income will self-populate. It'll fly in from your last most recently completed tax return. And for the most part, in, in my opinion, the FAFSA is relatively easy to complete. In fact, this is why we're not going into how to do it, because I think if you can do a tax return, if you can fill out a college application, you can probably do a FAFSA. And if you do need help, there is something called FAFSA Day. And this is where folks like myself or accountants or even guidance professionals would set up shop in various places around Connecticut. And if you need help, you bring all your papers and things and come in and those folks will help you. I'm not sure quite how this is happening in the COVID era, but by all means, Google up for FAFSA day if you need some one-on-one -on -one support. Uh, but generally speaking, the FAFSA is pretty easy. There is one or two trick questions, I guess, or you know, things I'll clarify. And one is they ask you about your investments. And investments, of course, can mean your mutual funds, your stocks and bonds, but is it your IRAs? and your Roths and your 401ks, the answer is when they ask you about your investments, do not include IRAs, Roths, 401ks, or home equity. The investment question only relates to investments outside of retirement plans. In fact, your 401s and retirement plans and so forth and home equity will not be included towards your ability to pay in terms of uh, the FAFSA. So really, when we do the FAFSA or think of it, there's nine areas that they're going to request information in. And the first six of which are really demographical in nature, uh, and they don't affect your ability to receive financial aid except for the drug conviction status, which, by the way, is going away soon. It is possible that if it was a drug conviction in someone's past, that doesn't necessarily automatically disqualify them for receiving financial aid from Uncle Sam. So we spend most of our time over here on these last three blocks. And just to kind of dive in a bit on some of the detail, the first one, independent student versus dependent student. What does that mean? Well, it means whether we need to look at the parents, assets and income or not. And you may remember from many years ago when you and I went to school, it was possible 
to live away from your parents, to have an apartment, have a bill in your own name. And if you did it long enough, you were considered independent. And the parents no longer had to fill out information on the financial aid form. Well, that's more or less gone away. And now it's very difficult to be declared independent. In fact, you would have to be over, uh, you'd have to be married, uh, a ward of the court, have children, veteran of the armed services, over age 24, uh, a, 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 you know, graduate student, things that very likely will not apply to the vast majority of the people in this room. So likely they, your students will be dependent and we will be required to disclose assets and income as parents, which goes to the second question, who is the parent or who is the guardian? Well, that would seem obvious, except in a divorce scenario. And in a divorce scenario, it is possible, at least for this one more year before they make changes, for us to control who is the one that fills out the financial aid form in a divorce scenario. And right now the rule says it's the parent where the children spend the most time. And that usually means where do they sleep the most, it doesn't necessarily mean what the divorce decree says or who takes the tax deduction. Those two are almost never the issue. It's what school district do they live in? Where do they sleep the most? And if we're able to control that in a way that makes sense, it would be best for the parent with the lesser assets and income to be the one that completes the FAFSA. And in that scenario, the other parent who theoretically has more assets and income is not considered at all. And that's semi-favorable. Uh, that's changing. I'll address that in a minute, though. So we spend the most amount of our time down here on this household assets and income section. And, and income is easy. Income, you put in your social, it goes and pulls your information down from your last tax return. And there's not much more for us to do there on that. But assets is a little bit different. And I am asked all the time, I have savings, I have cash, I have checking, you know, investments, stocks, whatever. Do I have to hide this stuff? Do I need a shovel and a coffee can and bury it in the backyard? Because we've heard kind of through the grapevine that if you have savings and things, it may count against you. And the answer is yes, it will. And so I've made a little list here to show the common types of investment savings or accounts that will usually count towards your ability to pay on the FAFSA. But really what's most important is who owns it. It doesn't matter if it's a stock, a bond, a boat, or a jet airplane. If it's owned individually or jointly by yourself or your spouse, it's very likely going to be considered as a resource that you will need to use to help pay for college. On the other side of this little screen here are all the things that generally are not considered on the FAFSA. Life insurance, cash value, IRAs, 401ks, home equity, annuities, many small businesses. So immediately we have the thought, oh, my God, I've got this stuff. I need to take all this stuff and move it over to here. Otherwise, it's going to be taken away or they're going to demand that I use it for college. And my thought is not so fast. There's a lot more to this story that I will give you, but for the short version is in 99% of the scenarios that we see, it does not make sense to try and move money around to receive more financial aid. In more instances than not, you end up shooting yourself in the foot and causing more problems than you intended. So I will share with you the details why, but for now, just know that probably it's not a priority for us to scurry around and try and hide assets. So let's carry on a little bit here. Uh, once you've completed the FAFSA, what happens next? Well, you will receive what's called a student aid report. And this is a uh, thing I would suggest you print because the first thing is it has all the data inputs you put in. It'll say, what'd you put on line six? What'd you put on line 10 and so on? And if the financial aid awards come back you're greatly different than we imagined from what we expected, the first place we're going to go is the student aid report to look to see if, uh, gosh, did we put line six on line seven? Did we have an extra zero somewhere? It's really kind of a troubleshooting thing. But it will also show your preliminary expected contribution, EFC, expected family contribution, which is really what the government's opinion of your ability to pay is. And we'll dig into that a bit more. Uh, it allows for corrections, updates, 
And then, you know, you don't have to put, you don't have to send this information to every school. On the FAFSA, you plug in the schools you want it to be sent to, and the FAFSA system will automatically send it to the schools that you uh, indicate. And then in the springtime, you will get a letter back from each of your schools that say, congratulations, you're accepted. And here is the financial aid offer that we can make based on your FAFSA and our school endowment and so on. There is room for corrections and appeals, and we'll dig into that a little bit separately, but more or less, the FAFSA is relatively simple. You shouldn't have too much of a problem, an hour, hour and a half tops with a cup of coffee, and you should be able to do just fine. Now, I mentioned there are some changes coming. And effective in July 2023. Yes, I want to throw it to you. Oh, if you could please mute there, and Catherine, please make sure everyone's muted. Uh, there is going to be some changes to the FAFSA, and a new form will be available um, this fall. And to their credit, they did reduce um, all the questions. Uh, we used to be 108, now down to 36. They simplified a few things. They changed some terminology. They got rid of the need for men to uh, register for the draft. More dollars are available. Some things are, you know, we thought might change, didn't change. And so generally speaking, the changes to the FAFSA are good. However, there are two things that cause me great concern. And one of them is in the event of a divorce or separation for the new form, if students' parents are divorced or separated, the previous definition of who should fill out the form has been scrapped and it has now been changed to be whichever parent provides the most support. And that could mean whoever has the most assets, the most income, who pays the alimony, who plays the child support, so probably for most of the people in this room, we're going to encounter that change at least in the second year, if not sooner. And so I, I think it's important to strategize not only for now, but also for the coming changes. Uh, one other change that causes me great concern is currently if you have more than one student in school at the same time, your household ability to pay is currently divided by the number of students in school. In other words, if you have a $10,000 ability to pay and you have 10 students, you know, all of those students will be allocated $1,000 towards their ability to pay, which greatly amplifies their need for financial support. However, it looks like it's going to be changed to that ability to pay number is a per student number, which makes zero sense in my thinking. And there is a lot of thought that this may actually be an oversight uh, we do have some lobbyists in Congress right now trying to dig into this, but so far there's been no result. I hope really soon we have clarification. Uh, and of course, we will keep you updated as best we can. <clears throat> but wait, there's more. The FAFSA is relatively simple and easy, but there is a second financial data gathering form called the CSS Profile. And the CSS profile is used by collegeboards.com. If you haven't encountered College Board yet, I'm sure you will soon. And while the FAFSA is governmental and is regulated a lot by Congress as to what they can ask and what they can do, the CSS profile is private and they can ask and do anything they darn well please. So while the FAFSA is easy, the CSS profile is extremely complex and extremely invasive. It does require much more detail. Thank goodness we only have to do it once, whereas the FAFSA we do every year. There is a fee for completing the profile, and it may in some cases be a per school fee. And it does already ask for information about non-custodial parents in the event of a divorce. And it already asks about retirement accounts and home equity. So what schools use this form? Well, schools that we call mini elite schools. And these are schools that are not, they're not full on Ivy League like Princeton or Cornell or Yale or Brown or whatnot, but they would like to be. And so we consider them to be the schools that are more expensive than or think they are more prestigious than UConn. So this means Rochester, Syracuse, Rhode Island School of Design, Marist, uh, Fairfield, uh, St. Joe's, which are quite likely all the schools your kids are considering, right? Because we come from the West Hartford School District, which is one of the top school districts in the nation. 
And so because of that, we have affluent communities with highly educated children who have an expectation and frankly, probably deserve a high level of academic achievement. And those are the mini elites. So the reason I mention this is because while we think we can move money around to hide stuff, very likely the vast majority of us will be encountering the profile and the profile already asks about everything. There is no sheltering of savings investments or assets when it comes to the profile. So let's walk through some of the math to help put some clarity onto this. What both of these forms are designed to do is to determine your ability to pay. And they hide it in language called the expected family contribution, keyword here being expected. We are expected to contribute. And these forms are designed to determine in the government's infinite wisdom, your ability to pay. And it starts with the cost of attendance for whatever school you're considering minus what the forms say your ability to pay is equals financial need. And that need is the part that theoretically we should receive some support on. For example, let's go to ABC Community College and it costs 20,000 to attend there. And we go through the math and stuff and find that your ability to pay is $5,000 and therefore your need, very simple, 20,000 minus five is 15. That's what we should qualify for in terms of a financial package. And most of us go, aha, I get that. That makes perfect sense, which also means that if the cost of attendance goes up because my ability to pay is fixed based on assets and income that I have you know, shared on these forms, for a more expensive school, my need should go up and I qualify for more stuff, right? Well, there's a couple of problems with that thought processes. And the first is what we call gapping. And gapping says there just is not enough financial support out there to support these gigantic needs we are seeing at some of these expensive schools. School costs has gone up and up and up and up. And financially, it's being cut and cut and cut and cut. And we're getting this widening gap between what we think the need is versus the types of support that are out there. The second problem is that $5,000 here. I put that there for a reason. And the reason is when we go to talk to families at their homes and say, tell us about your family and your college plans. And by the way, what do you have in your budget each year to help pay for college? Invariably, the answer is somewhere around $5,000 a year. So we think that we have room in our budget, rough guess, $5,000 a year to pay for college. But the financial aid system has a much different impression on your ability to pay. And many times it's a shock and a surprise. So I wanna share with you a very, very simple example, a state university, UConn, if you will, $30,000 cost of attendance plus minus. For a family making $125,000 a year of income with no assets, no savings, no investments, just income alone, that income alone will generate $23,000 plus of ability to pay. What the feds are saying, is that if we have an income of 125, we should also have $23,000 of discretionary cash flow to help pay for college per year. So really our need in that scenario is only $6,300. That will be filled by the Stafford loan and that's about it. So we have this thought that assets are what caused the problem to receive financial aid and it's, that's not the case. It's income that causes the problem. In fact, if we add $50,000 of assets to this story, it doesn't change much. It went from 23,000 to 26,000 based on 50 grand of assets. So if there's anything that I would like you to remember from what we have talked about so far, it's not the assets that we need to be alarmed about. It is the income that we have sufficient enough to live and breathe and walk down the street in Connecticut, let alone play taxes in West Hartford, income likely takes us out of range to qualify for what the vast majority of us would consider to be financial aid. Let's dig into this a little bit more. If we looked at the assets and the income of parents and children, they want 5.6% of any assets owned by the kids. The first 17 and some change is free, but anything above that, they want 5.6 to go towards ability to pay. And that's where we say, oh my goodness, I need a coffee can and a shovel and go bury all my stuff in the backyard. 
kids' money. They want 20% of anything that has the kid's name on it. But we never really get to the second part of the equation. And the second part is income is assessed at anywhere from zero to 25% of your adjusted gross income. Kids, they want 50% of everything they earn. But the problem is not you know, working at stop and shop bagging groceries because we can protect the first 6,300. The problem with kids is capital gains. We have a stock, a bond or a mutual fund that we've been saving in and it's done well, right? And we sell it to create dollar bills to pay for the college bill with and that sale creates a capital gain, which is income and they want half. So the timing and the management of how we use our assets and deploy them is also important. So I want you to remember income is the problem, not the assets. In fact, it's so much of an issue that we've invented a concept that will help you called the income hot zone. And the income hot zone suggests that if you have income from anywhere from zero to $60,000, there's nothing for you to do you will qualify for the maximum amount of financial aid available. And that equates to roughly $17,000 worth of support that you will qualify for without really having to do anything. Anywhere from 60 to $120,000 is kind of a question mark on what you might qualify for because there's phase outs and cutoffs and various plans. But as we get above 120,000 more of income again, there's nothing for us to do because you are out of range to qualify for anything based on income alone for anything except what we call the basic package. And the basic package is $5,500 on a Stafford loan, $2,000 of work study. That's it. That's a known. That's a 100% outcome. I can tell you that is what will happen. So in fact, financial aid is a terrible word to describe what we get. What we get is a loan package. And as soon as we understand that financial aid or the support we would see for most families as a loan package, we start to make much better choices about what is doable, realistic, and affordable for school. And that leads us to the second player in this process, which is the parents. And the parents have a role in this. You know, we have to kind of be parents and help our kids make great decisions because these days kids are really attracted to and in often cases expect and feel that they deserve the very best. And college recruiters are definitely talking to our kids saying, yeah, we're expensive, you know, but it's OK. We'll help you out. You'll get support. By the way, would you like a single sweet dorm? You want to study overseas? You know, they're, they're, they're a sales force. They are their job is to get people to come to their school and pay a lot of money at very expensive schools. And, and I actually probably need to update my slides here. This is 2020 data. But, uh, you know, it's shocking to say that some of these schools are in the 70s. Even UConn is at 34. Penn State, I tracked very closely. When my son was going in as a freshman, it was 48. It's now 52 for Penn State. Even Central is 26. So we look at some of this stuff and we say, my goodness, how am I going to afford some of these things? And then we remember financial aid, but it may in many cases be uh, you know, a struggle to get the support we want. It's important to understand what financial aid really means in terms of boots on the ground. And uh, this is a, a letter I received from a client. It's a couple of years old, but the data is still good. And in this case, they wanted to go to Yukon. Is $28,000 of tuition at that time. And they got a bunch of stuff and the amount due by parents out of pocket was 2,800. And my client calls up and said, you know, this is good, right? I mean, 2,800 out of pocket, that's, that's really good, right? But when we dig in more closely, the vast majority of the support that they would receive is lending. So we're still paying for the total cost of school just over time and with interest. And I think it's important to help our kids understand that in many cases, the vast amount of the support they get is lending. And kids, unfortunately, have no concept of what lending really means. And right now, the national average, you know, if you look in the newspaper, they will see the national average for a graduating student is about 26,000. And yeah, that's true. But that also takes into account the folks are going to Manchester Community College or Central or Eastern, as well as the people going to Wesleyan, Northeastern and Boston University. So it averages at 26. But our community here 
educated, successful, uh, you know, affluent, if you will, uh, you know, achievers probably are looking for a little better experience. And we find that most of the kids at this level are graduating with closer to 70 something thousand dollars worth of debt. That's a condo mortgage without the condo. And our kids will say things to us as parents. They will say, mom, dad, don't worry. I'm going to study at a great school and I get great grades. I have a lot of money. I'll figure it out. I'll pay for it when I get out. Kids don't have any idea what 70 or $80,000 worth of debt means. So when you talk to your kids about the total amount of debt they would take on at some of these upper level schools, don't talk about the total amount they're borrowing. Talk about the monthly payment. And we have a very simple formula that we share that says that we want to take whatever the total amount of debt is and divide it by 100. If you have $80,000 of debt divided by 100, whatever the result is, that's your monthly loan payment. 80,000 of debt will generate an $800 a month loan payment. And when you share that with your kids, they understand that. They understand that they'll have an $800 a month loan payment. They're paying for an apartment with a roommate. They've got a car, groceries, you know, what's left over for beer and dates or whatever. So uh, help your kids to understand that. We say things to kids all the time like, listen, you're smart. You got accepted to some great schools. Be smart one more time and make a value-based choice that is realistic and affordable rather than a brand-based choice that's being influenced by what you see on television and what you hear in the hallways. Thank you, Melaine. I appreciate that. <laughs> Which leads us to the students. You know, they've got a role in this too. And we want them to understand that this is not playtime and that this is a transition from teenhood to adulthood. In fact, many of you parents may be very surprised to learn <clears throat> that the university will not give you access to your students' grades or even your students' bill that you have to pay. Your student has to authorize you as parent to be able to see the stupid bill that you are paying. And that's because they want the kids to own this process and to transition into be responsible adults. And we want them to know this going in that part of their job is to find and manage the many sources of paying for school. We want the kids completing the FAFSA, not the parents. We want the kids to make smart choices regarding school costs. Understand the difference between the free money and the not so free money. Remember, by the way, that there is no more student loan deferral. Everything is due right away, as in right away. So that old guaranteed student loan program where you could defer it till after the kids graduate, that's gone. And so we have to understand that the financial responsibilities of this are many times the kids are taking on some student loan payments almost right away. Let's help them to understand that. Let's have them looking for scholarships and, and monies. In days past, we used to rec recommend a whole bunch of websites that would help you with scholarship searches. We've done away with that. And now we simply recommend the Scholly app. It's available on the app store. You can find it at myscholly.com and it's a little gizmo you put in your phone and you enter in all kinds of details about your student and the thing goes out into the metaverse or whatever we call it now and finds all different sorts of support that is available for your student, matches it up, and then brings you back a list with an easy to use interface to apply and track those scholarships. We think every student should have this app on their phone. And when they're sitting around waiting for the bus, or in they're in the dentist's office waiting for their cleaning or whatever it is, they can pull out their phone and do, 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 do some stuff. And you can as parents too, the accounts synchronize. And my little friend here is a great example. Uh, he won 35 little tiny scholarships and went to Drexel for free. Uh, a lot of effort, but it can be done. And if we want our kids to be involved in this process, the two things that I think they can mostly do on this side is number one, complete the FAFSA and Tyler on their own. And number two, start to use the Scholly app and track and apply for their own scholarships. So speaking of financial aid, when we discuss financial aid, we often talk about what we would want to see from Uncle Sam, or I guess it's Uncle Malloy, uh, you know, and there is still stuff available from the feds There's the Pell Grant and some other things. And there's money's available for the state. But I have to tell you, the vast majority of this stuff, you and I are not going to see. 
uh, that's the stuff that the families in that lower income range of the income hot zone are going to see. So I've got to retrain your thinking. And I want to retrain your thinking to, to find where the stuff that you and I are going to qualify for, and that is either career specific things or merit and achievement dollars. And career specific dollars, the best example I can think of that, love it or not, is probably the ROTC program, Reserve Officer Training Corps. And if you're interested in the United States military and serving the country, you can receive scholarships to go to school. They'll pay for just about everything. You serve in the military after that and then uh, finish up with possible pensions and healthcare options. Not a bad deal for those who like it. But similar options include the TEACH grant, where if you're willing to teach uh, sciences or math in schools that need it, you can receive uh, loan forgiveness and grant dollars. There's dollars available for healthcare, nurses, firefighters, and uh, police officers. So consider Googling up for the field of study that your kids are interested in, and you may find some career-specific stuff. But by far, the most successful results are achieved through merit and achievement dollars. These are scholarships dollars or academic awards or leadership grants. And the vast majority of this always has been and always will be grades based. And I'm often asked, well, what grades? Well, on an unweighted system, this is kind of general, but here's a thumbnail. We suggest that the scholarships and achievement and merit dollars start at about a 3.5 GPA. And around that level, you start to see the presidential scholarship for perhaps $8,000 a year. As you get up to three, six, three, seven, that goes to 12, even $16,000. Going beyond that, 3839, you're going to start to see money from the endowment and the grants from the universities themselves. It's not unusual to see upwards of $30,000 a year in support dollars. Get up to 44142, we start getting into the high 30s, even low 40s in terms of uh, support for college. So uh, we really recommend that the Scully app is kind of cool, but you're nickel and diming it one or $2,000 a year. If you were gonna spend money on anything or spend time on anything, I would suggest it's either SAT prep or involvement in the community or outside activities in school, leadership programs, candy stripers, EMT program, Eagle Scout, Civil Air Patrol, whatever it is that you can bring in these achievements and uh, you know, letters of recommendation and certificates of award and newspaper articles and all those things we want to build and put together to really put the best foot forward for our students. And that tends to lead to significant amounts of money, both at state and many elite schools, which now leads to the next player in the process. And the next player is the schools. And their job is to make an offer and sometime or another, usually in the spring of the senior year, you're going to get a letter that looks something like this. <clears throat> now I've summarized here, but this is actual data from an actual student a few years ago. At the time, Rochester was 50,000 a year. The student had very high achievement in terms of grades and class standing. Uh, and Rochester says, wow, you know, we, we'd love to have you. And so uh, we'll offer you upwards of $20,000 worth of grant and scholarship dollars the max amount of work study that was available at the time, the maximum subsidized loan, which by the way, that 3,500, that is the only loan where the payments and interest are deferred until after graduation and the max you can get is 3,500. But they also offered the 2,000 unsubsidized, that's the one where the payments and interest start right away. So all in $27,000 of support. They met more than half the cost of school and said, hey, how about you come to Rochester? And she says, gosh, thank you guys, that's great. But I really wanna see what UConn has to say. And so we sent the same package to UConn and UConn says, well, you know, you've got great achievement. We'd love to have you. We will offer $4,000 on that academic excellence program. We'll give your parents the privilege of borrowing 15,500 at 7.9% per year. No work study, no subsidized loan, all unsubsidized loan. And how about you consider coming to UConn? And we says, well, you know, gosh, I, you know, I know you can't put a lot into the academic stuff because you don't have these huge endowments, but you also don't cost as much either. So maybe it's okay. But I wonder about this stuff. Federal programs, federal work study, federal direct program that is offered at one school, but not offered at another. That's bizarre. 
these are federal programs, right? Shouldn't they be consistent between schools? And the answer is no. And it's because the feds drive this money down to the school level for them to distribute how they see fit in order to attract whoever they want to attract. And when I said that or saw that, I said, aha, I got you. Now I know we can negotiate. So when you get your offers back in the springtime, we are not done. We have seen in many years of observation that schools will offer about 70% of their total awards for the year on the first round. And that is because they wanna leave room for the negotiation and appeals. So we suggest that after you get these offers, you narrow it down to the top two or three choices. And now we go into the negotiation phase. There are four points that we can negotiate on. Point number one, unmet need. Remember a bunch of slides ago, we talked about gapping, how there might be you know, a higher need than is being filled by the dollars that are available. That's the single biggest thing that we want to start our negotiations on. Number two, unusual achievement. What can we bring forward about this student that is unique and exciting? their leadership certificates, their service in the community, their Eagle Scout, if they're Civil Air Patrol, their SPATS awards, whatever your sports, newspaper clippings, we want that school to understand what a fantastic student they would be getting if only they could help just that little bit more. Number three, unusual circumstances. Hey, I know one, how about COVID? How did COVID affect you financially? Did you have uh, cutback in hours? Did you have to work from home? Did your business struggle? Uh, did you have to raid your investments to support your family? Or did your students struggle because they didn't have in-classroom learning? You know, let's bring forth that story, but I want to you know, encourage you to approach it from a perspective of don't say everything was terrible. Let's talk about everything was terrible, but here's how we overcame it. And here's how we achieved in light of these difficulties. But let's bring that story forward if need be. And number four, competition between schools. And this is where I hear this a lot. I hear families say we're applying for two or three schools because that's their top choices. Yeah, but we need probably eight to 12 offers in order to have enough competition between these schools where we can say to school A, we'd love to come to see you guys, but school B over here offered us whatever. And if you could only kindly match that, and here's all the reasons why you should, we'd be happy to accept your offer. Uh, so how do we do this? We write a letter. Don't call them. Don't email them. Don't Skype them. It's too easy for them to blow you off. Don't even use the form that says, I'd like to do an appeal. And they have this little box here. It's like an inch. And it says, write your circumstances. In that box, I write, see attached. And then I write a letter. It's a page, a page and a half, two pages long. That's a narrative that talks about your family and your story relative to those four points. Send it FedEx. Make them sign for it. Send it to everybody that you encountered. Hopefully, when you go on these school visits and all the counselors and people are putting out their business cards everywhere, I hope you take every business card from everyone you encounter. And then when you get home, you pull out those business cards and hand write a thank you note to every last one of them and say, thank you. I enjoyed chatting with you. By the way, enclosed is my pro forma, my resume, my certificates and things. And also, do you know anybody else that I should share this with? We want to stand out from the crowd so that when you do call them, they say, ah, Mr. Jones, we were expecting your call. So let's go through that process. Um, Here's some of the results we've seen. Uh, we get letters all the time back from families and clients that we coach on this. And I want to say at least half of the time, we get an improvement in the offer. Uh, this one is Quinnipiac, maybe an all-time you know, upgrade for Quinnipiac. I don't know. Quinnipiac's pretty tough. Uh, but this is not just a one-off. We see this all the time. And the schools are now building this into their system, so much so that we're now starting to see in their letters this is our final offer. We are not open to negotiation. Yeah, right. I negotiate anyways. All right, let's do a quick update on COVID. <clears throat> so COVID is still real. It's still out there. We're seeing it even now as we speak. And I want to share with you kind of what I call the Penn State update. When my son was first going to school as a freshman, it was total shutdown. 
they were doing their classes in their pajamas from their dorm room. They couldn't even go to the cafeteria to get food. They had to get it in a brown bag and take it somewhere else to eat it. My son was so depressed and so sick of it that he went to the classroom where there would have been his class and watched the class on Zoom on his laptop in the room where it would have been held just to have something that looked like a college experience. This is that same classroom today. Sorry. Uh, so I'm actually very happy to see butts and seats and everyone is still wearing masks and so forth, but the college experience is better than it may have been in the past. Uh, but there's still the risk of shutdown if we have seen. My son does have one class right now that is 100% virtual, but it is getting better. Uh, my point with this is I think there are some factors associated with COVID that we should be aware of and consider and maybe even neg negotiate on. We think there is an increased ability to negotiate because of COVID, whether there's online classes or not, or whether you struggled because of online in high school. And there may be even tuition offsets due to a high number of online courses. But also there's a reduced ability for schools to provide support. And uh, you know they, their endowments and their profits have been hit just like everybody else. So they may not have as much money as before. Uh, there's increased access to your personal IRAs for college due to some COVID rules. Although there's offset by increased risk of shutdown, we've been told time and time again, pack lightly, because if we get a massive outbreak, we might be calling you to come pick up your kids within 24 hours and you're jamming everything into the back of the SUV. Uh, you know, increased likelihood of stress. I think we have to remember that kids are still kids and even they're away and, and in college, they're still dealing with some very difficult stuff. Uh, three weeks in, I, you know, my son is very strong, but I started getting calls from him. I could tell him his dad, I know he's struggling. So two days later, I went out to see him for that weekend and he was thrilled to see that even though he's away, Dad is just, you know, a five hour drive away and I can go see him if need be. So <clears throat> let's keep those in mind as we build our college plans. Finally, the last player in this process is the financial firms and financial firms do a bunch of things. They can provide financial instruments and research and strategies such as what we do. Uh, but there's also banks and lenders and investment companies. And I want to highlight two in particular. One of them is Chet. And I am asked all the time. Where should we put our college money? And the no-brainer answer for a state of Connecticut resident is the state's chat plan. Uh, used to be run by the Hartford. It is now run by Fidelity. We think that is a good thing. Fidelity does a great job. But the main reason that we use it is because it is the only plan on the planet that will give a state of Connecticut resident a $10,000 per year tax deduction for deposits that they make. And yet, when I go to see people at their homes and ask about their savings and so forth, I'm seeing over and over again, non-state of Connecticut chat plans. And I have to ask, how did this happen? Who advised you to forego the tax deduction and why? And often it was a financial advisor who says, well, the performance on chat is terrible. Garbage. It's run by Fidelity. We have Contra Fund in the thing, which is the number one performing fund of all time. The problem is not the Chet plan. The problem is the age-based portfolios that the advisors recommend because they don't want to manage these 529 plans. They're not profitable for them. They're a pain in the rear. They don't know how to use them properly. So they automate it by using the age-based plans. Problem with the age-based plan is as the kids get older, it transitions to a portfolio that is more conservative, basically more bonds in it. And if you understand, in a rising interest rate environment, bonds go down, it's basically a guaranteed relationship. Your 529 plans in the age-based portfolio have a component that is very likely underperforming. So the problem is not the plan, it's the advisor who doesn't know how to use it. And I would encourage you that if you have a non-chat plan to ask your advisor how that happened. Uh, the second folks I wanna point out is Chesla. Chesla is the state of Connecticut's lending agency. We think they do a great job of making dollars available in additional loans for Connecticut residents to use at the school of your choice. I might need to update my slide. I'm not sure if it's 4.9 fixed. I think it's actually lower 
but that's a pretty decent rate. It is tax deductible. And what I also really like is that it has a co-borrower release feature, which means that if your students or yourself meet the payments on time after you graduate for a period of years, you as a co-signer, a parent, can be carved off of the loan. And that's a good thing because it opens up your ability to borrow for additional students or for yourselves rather than being locked into essentially a debt that you co-own with your students. <clears throat> okay, we'll do the last uh, two or three minutes here and then we'll open up for questions. I know for a lot of folks, this can be a difficult and conversation, you know, but I have to tell you the truth. I'm not telling you this to scare you. I'm telling you this to show you the way out. In fact, if you lose sleep over what we've talked about today, then I have failed you. It's not to scare you. It's to help you understand the truth of the story so you can make good decisions and find your own way out. The strategy that we use over and over again to help pay for college is something called stacking. And stacking says there is no one single solution to all of this. There's many solutions. And once we start to stack them together, it starts to look like a way to pay for college, starting with what we call the come to Jesus conversation. And that means that if you're kind of feeling a little squirmy right now, that you might not have enough funding for the college of your plans. That just means you're normal. But it also means we need to have a reality based conversation of what is doable and achievable and perhaps get serious about redirecting funds from cash flow into college savings. Now, I'm not trying to say jam a lot of money into college savings to have enough to pay for the whole thing in one shot. No one does that. What I want to do is to train your household, train your budget to have an item in your budget that is meaningful and says college, because later on, we're going to redirect that savings that you currently put in your Cheddar 529 plan. We're going to redirect it to the university on part of their monthly payment plan. But we're also gonna augment it with distributions from your savings and investments. And yes, by the way, while we are here, we should pull in the double E bonds, the old Janus plan mutual fund, the savings account, the stuff that your daughter did when she was babysitting. We've got stuff everywhere. Let's get it into a chat, get a tax deduction, grow double tax free from that point on and make meaningful projections as to how our resources are going to be deployed. Most of us are contributing more to our 401ks than we are to college. And I might encourage you to back off of that for a little while if you're a little bit short for funds. Now is not the time to overpay on debt or to try and settle the mortgage quickly or to refinance or redo the kitchen. Let's be realistic about using our funds effectively so that we can get the kids off to school. Most people will qualify and use a Stafford loan. You might talk to Chesla for additional funding. You might use Scully or find merit or academic achievement scholarships. You might transition a Roth into a Chet 529. We didn't talk about this, but it is possible to recategorize a Roth and send it into Chet and get some tax deductions to do so. The state might have some support for you as well. Some people based on income will qualify for tax credits. Some people might talk to grandparents or other family members as stakeholders and have them assist as well. And then we get creative. Let's restructure our cash value life insurance, for instance. If you have those insurance policies that have a lot of cash value, you might be approaching a point where we not, might not need as much life insurance anymore because you've saved, your mortgage is paid and so on, and the kids are getting older. So let's surrender that policy pay a little bit of taxes on the cash value, send those proceeds to Chet, get a tax deduction on the deposit, grow double tax free from that day forward and replace the insurance we just surrendered with inexpensive term and use the savings and premiums to also go into Chet and get tax deductions. My point is that unless your advisor understands all of these moving parts, you might be walking past some very big opportunities, and we'd be happy to help you think through that. Eventually, we want to build a cash flow model. And this is a little movie that shows one where we plug in the students, what we think it costs for school, what we think their scholarships will be, the total amount due by parents, then plug in the various cash flows or stock options or loans or savings or whatever it is, we're going to use the model how to pay for two, three, four kids out the door. Suddenly, we have a 30,000-foot view on how we're going to get this done. 
Those of you who are Excel whizzes, I know you know just what to do. But you don't have to be an Excel whiz to do this. You can do it on the back of a Wendy's placemat. I just want to encourage you to, all right, well, little Johnny's going to UConn, it's 30,000, but four years of that, you know, lending, and then Gene comes on, and just give it some thinking through so that you have a model and some realistic thinking about how it is we're going to pay for college. So what did we learn today? We learned number one, let's keep the expectations under control that kids are driving this conversation based on an expectation of a college experience that may or may not be affordable. So let's have a reality-based conversation at the kitchen table of the state of the family's finances and not just for that first kid, but also for the second and third one that comes along behind them. Number two, don't shoot yourself in the foot. Let's understand how the game is played. It doesn't make sense to try and hide your money. It makes more sense to be efficient and effective with the money that you have. That also means number three, let's use other people's money. That's lending, that's scholarships, that's grandparents, that's family members, that's other stakeholders. Let's negotiate, kick, scream and appeal all of our awards. In the vast majority of cases, families will see an improvement in their financial aid award if they appeal the first draft. Think stacking. There's no one single solution. It's lots of little ideas that we pile on top of each other and still it starts to look like a way to pay for college. And finally, it's cash flow management that makes this work. It's not saving and paying for the whole thing in one shot. It's understanding this input, that input, the scholarship, the loan, the cash flow, the taxes, the assets, the blah, 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 blah. and an Excel grid or a cash flow model can help. And finally, of course, grab some help if you need it. I know Malane's office is fantastic. They have great resources on scholarships and also families that have gone before you. They can tell you what other students have done and hopefully those things will help you. So I know we just blasted through a pile of information and I do wanna stop and kind of open the floor for questions. <clears throat> so if you do have a question and uh, you'd like to share with the group, please go ahead and just unmute yourself and uh, we'll take a round of questions if we can. So please, anyone at all, go ahead and unmute and, and fire away. Any questions or thoughts? Any questions, any thoughts, go ahead and please unmute. Can you go over the four points that you said? Um, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Zobia. Uh, so really quickly, the four points. Number one, unmet need. That's the mathematical difference between what the system says you should be able to afford versus what you are actually given in terms of financial support. If you wanna do the math on that with me, I'll be happy to look at it, your family, send me a note, send me your numbers, we'll take a look at it. Number two, unrecognized achievement. Let's draw forward what is special and unique about this student. In fact, let me show you something really super fast. We believe in creating a pro forma. I, I call it a pro forma, but it's really a letter that is a summary about your student that introduces the student to the school. And maybe inside of that is some letters of recommendation and, you know, that they've received, maybe a copy of their recent resume, but also copies of the certificates and awards that they have earned, even so far as to go to photographs of them doing all these amazing things that they have done. So we wanna bring forward this story about your student to the people that are decision makers on it and make sure they're really clear on what a fantastic student you have. Number three, unusual circumstances. You know, did someone get laid off? Did COVID affect you? Did your business get hurt? Was there a healthcare crisis? Did, uh, you know, any of the unusual circumstances that make it challenging to pay for school or to save for in or invest for school? And finally, competition between schools. Don't be afraid to share the awards from one school with the school of your choice and say, I really want to go to Boston University, but, uh, you know, gosh, Fairfield offered this amazing thing. And if you could only match it, you know, that would be helpful. So thank you, Zobia. Great question. Others, please. Any other questions at all? Yeah, I, I have a I have a question, Charles. Yes, Thank you so much. I attended your uh, this uh, webinar like live in Connor. It oh, was okay, really great, excellent. Two years ago, you know. Uh, uh, I have a question for you. So um, the the FAFSA when we submitted it, which I did already, and it was based on 2020 uh, tax return. Yes. 
And now uh, we're way, my child uh, has been accepted to three schools. And now we're waiting, crossing our fingers, what is the package, what is the financial package sure. will look like? Uh, the thing is, in 2021, I got laid off. So I stayed for almost 13, well, 14 months unemployed. And all of a sudden, uh, not all of a sudden, of course, I did an effort. Uh, I got an, you know, a job where I'm going to be making 40% more what I used to make, like in, like in the $300,000, you know. Yeah, uh, I understand. But then uh, the schools are asking us for special circumstance to give them the estimated 2022. Yes, of course. So what happened to 2021 where... You know, uh, where we didn't have any income and we lived under unemployment for about 14 months. And so I have I need time to build up again my funds. Yes. Well, that's absolutely uh, absolutely an appealable point that you should bring forward. Uh, I think it's important to tell the whole story. And this is why we say when they ask you, you know, tell us your story and they give you this one inch box to tell the story. That's not sufficient. We want to have, you know, a page, page and a half, whatever it takes to tell your story. And don't be afraid to hold back on what happened in 21. You know, those are relevant points. Now, you have to complete the FAFSA based on what legitimate questions and, and, and you know, numbers you have. But the whole negotiation and appeal process is designed to accommodate all those special circumstances that don't show up on the FAFSA. Uh, you're a great candidate for appeal. If you'd like to talk more about that, just send me a note later. I'll show you how to contact me. I'll be happy to help you. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Great questions. Others, please. Any other questions? So Question I, about, go ahead. I, let's, let's do Jane first and then Kathy. Okay, Jane, go ahead. So where does the 529 funds, where do you report those and how generally does that impact you, you know, what the school gives you? Because a few years ago, I had a cousin say, you may as well do your roof rather than putting money in your 529 because okay. they're just going to take it right off the top. So I'm going to disagree with your cousin because <laughs> they don't take it away. Nobody's going to say you have to spend your 529 or you have to sell your car. That's not going to happen. They're just going to say, based on your resources, here's your ability to pay. And, you know, you get to make a choice on how to deploy your ability to pay. It's an expensive school or an inexpensive school. We make value based choices on the brands we want to buy. And we're not going to be rewarded for an expensive school. Now, to your question, 529s are considered a parental asset, which is favorable. Parents' assets are counted far less than kids' assets are. However, it is probably irrelevant because your income very likely takes you out of range to qualify for anything from Uncle Sam, and the assets just make that non-qualification that much worse. So we generally suggest don't worry so much about the assets. Worry more about how are we going to manage the resources you have to be as effective as possible. But I would not spend them down because we're going to need them. Don't put the roof because the only way you're going to get the money back out of the roof is to borrow to get it back out. So please, yeah, hang on to those 529s. Let's find a way to deploy them. Uh, Kathy M., you had a question, please. Yeah, um, so we're going to have to have some kind of loan involved. And now my son has been offered um, subsidized loans. Yes. It's a minimal amount. And then, of course, there's me. Is it better to have a parent take out loans or the child? So it depends. We don't have a lot of choice on this. Any education loan, with one exception, will be taken in the names of the students with parents as co-signers. The exception is the PLUS loan program from the feds, and that stands for Parental Loan for Undergraduate Students. We frown on that program because it is a parental loan and you have no chance of handing it off to the kids unless you want to have them pay you and be their banker. Plus the interest rate is very high. We recommend Chesla instead. Um, I also recommend Citizens Bank. They're actually doing a really good job right now in the college loan market and they're very competitive. But yeah, we want the loan in the kids' names. We want them to own their package of loans. And uh, you know, in the end, if you wanna support them and help pay it off, fine, do so. But let's put them in the kids' names, not parents' names. Thank you. Uh, Annabelle, please, go ahead. Um, so I have a question. On your um, slideshow, it said EE savings bonds. What if you have like H's or I's? Do you count those? Because I counted yeah. all of them. 
more or less the same thing. I, I oh. lump them together into the category of government bonds. Yes. Thank you. And then my other question is like, if a kid gets a scholarship from a, an outside source, does that then get the decrease the amount that the school's giving them as a possible merit scholarship or does it come from the amount the child or the uh, EFC is? Not generally, although I have seen that happen. It does stink. You get something from the fire department and the school says, oh, that's nice. We offset it. You know, geez, guys, really? So um, I don't think I would make that a guiding factor for yourselves in terms of what you apply for. I would still run down every single college loan or scholarship you can, and we'll let the chips fall where they may and deal with it as we go. Great. Thank you. One or two more questions, and then we'll go to the chats. Uh, Carolyn, hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Hi, everybody. Um, I had a question about um, FAFSA versus CSS. If a family thinks that it won't qualify for need-based aid, is it still necessary to submit the FAFSA and or the CSS in order to qualify for merit aid? Great question. Thank you. Um, it, it hinges a little bit on whether you want the Stafford loan or not. We cannot get the Stafford loan without the FAFSA. And I do recommend that everybody should take the Stafford loan program. It's a good program. It gives the kids ownership in the process, skin in the game. These are great things. Uh, profile, many schools don't offer merit or scholarship dollars without the profile. And the concept is they're trying to identify whether someone is sheltering assets for the benefit of receiving free money. In other words, if you have $8 million in your 401k and not a penny saved for retirement, that's not going to be favorable and they want to detect that. Folks, by the way, uh, Carolyn here that just asked that question is Dr. Carolyn Sorkin, former admissions director at Brown University, and she runs a consulting practice in West Hartford that helps families with this whole process. And, and I hope many of you get a chance to meet her. Um, Alessandra, yes, please. Hi, um, I was wondering, what if uh, while we are paying for the school, something happens with us and changes our financial ability to pay mid-year? Yeah, good question. Uh, the only feedback I can give there is you negotiate an appeal. Uh, but the, the sad news is once the school has you, they know they have you. And so it's difficult for them to adjust the package very much once they know that your student is in love with that school and you'll do just about anything to keep them there. Uh, it is possible, I think, to threaten to transition to another school. Nine times out of 10, they say, go ahead. We've got 10 more lined up right behind you. So it's a challenging position, but I think that's the answer I would give is, a, is a appeal as best you can. Thank you. Sure, of course. One more and then we'll go to the chats. Going once, going twice. Okay, Melaine, I turn it over to you, my friend. Thank you so much for your group and for your, uh, your help. Thank you so much. This was really informative and helpful. And um, you guys had some great questions. Um, I'm not sure if there were any questions in the chat that were not addressed and I'm, I don't, I'm not sure if um, if we wanted to look at those before we end, but. Sure. Um, so I'm going to turn off my mic and my audio so that we can have some private conversation on chat if need be. But I will go to the chats and type responses to any questions that are there. I'll also share with you as, a, uh, as, as part of attending this presentation, we're offering a free consultation to anybody that would like it. And it's not just one. It's as many consultations as you need to help your family be successful. Obviously, this is a way that we meet new clients, but this is not a profit center. We don't charge for this. We don't charge for college guidance or planning. In the end, we are asset managers just like everybody else. And if you'd like us to manage accounts or investments, we're happy to do so. But for the rest of this, free of charge, I'd love to make friends and we'll be happy to do it. Uh, my assistant, Catherine, has posted in the chats a link where if you click on that link, it goes straight to my calendar. And you can plug yourself in for a phone or in-person consultation wherever you would like. So with that in mind, I'll say thank you all. I'm going to turn off audio and camera. We'll go to the chats. Thank you all so much for attending. And I uh, hope you all have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. And I will say this video is recorded. So yes. um, and I, it will be it. available for anyone who missed um, any part of the presentation. I will get the resources out to you guys um, as soon as I can. So thank you all for attending. Thank you. Good night.